Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we can finally begin talking about Intel's 10th generation Comet Lake H processors and how they perform. A couple of weeks ago in a joint unveiling with Nvidia, Intel detailed all the specifications for their 10th gen lineup but neglected to go into much detail on performance. But that all changes today. This video is going to be filled with benchmarks that disclose just how 10th gen is shaping up. And this has been an interesting generation for Intel. The first 10th gen parts launched in August of 2019, which is quite some time ago now, and was of course split into the confusing Comet Lake and Ice Lake U series, one on 14 nanometer and the other one on 10 nanometer. There's no such split for these higher power 45 watt chips in the H series. Intel is only offering Comet Lake, which is their 14 nanometer Skylake derivative. Yep. Five years after Skylake first launched, Intel is still pushing out new CPUs with the same base architecture. Today's review is covering the big story to come out of Intel's 10th gen unveil, pretty much the only big story if I'm honest, and that's the inclusion of a new 8-core SKU in the Core i7 range. 8-core H-series parts themselves aren't new, but with the 9th gen range, they were restricted to the Core i9 series, which tended to be only seen in very expensive notebooks. That changes with 10th gen and the inclusion of the Core i7-10875H, an 8-core 16-thread processor for a somewhat more mainstream market. This review will be comprehensively analyzing the i7-10875H and comparing it to previous products like the Core i9-9880H, Core i7-9750H, and AMD's new Ryzen 9 4900HS to see how it stacks up for high performance mobile productivity. Over the next few weeks and months, we'll hopefully be checking out a whole range of other 10th gen CPUs and doing all sorts of comparisons, including deeper dives into the new six core part, and how these chips fare for gaming. So if you want to know which mobile hardware to look out for in your next purchase, I think it's well worth subscribing to Hardware Unboxed. So as I mentioned, the focus of this video is the Core i7-10875H. So let's see where it fits in Intel's 10th gen lineup. This is the only eight core Core i7 part, the other two offerings being six cores and 12 threads like with the previous generation. To fit this part into the i7 line, Intel has reduced the Core i9 range down to just one part, also eight cores, but with higher clocks than this i7 CPU. And then the Core i5 range remains as quad cores. The listed specifications for the 10875H are very similar to the last gen Core i9-9880H in that we have a base clock of 2.3 gigahertz, 16 megabytes of level three cache, and a 45 watt TDP. The only real changes have occurred in the boost specs. Intel are now touting the ability to push up to 5.1 gigahertz on a single core, up from 4.8 gigahertz with the 9880H. However, this is only achievable with what Intel calls thermal velocity boost. Essentially, this gives the processor 200 megahertz of extra frequency when running below 65 degrees Celsius and 100 megahertz when running below 85 degrees Celsius. This means that if the CPU isn't running nice and cool, the actual maximum turbo frequency tops out at 4.9 gigahertz. Thermal velocity boost isn't new to Intel's 10th gen lineup. It was available with 9th gen Core i9 processors, including the 9880H, but Intel has tweaked the temperature thresholds and added it to the Core i7 line in this generation. As for all core turbo frequencies, Intel lists this as 4.3 GHz for the 10875H, up from 4.1 GHz with the 9880H. All up, this means we're getting 200 to 300 MHz clock speed increases under turbo conditions with the 10875H compared to the 9880H. However, with base clocks and power limits remaining the same, I'd expect long-term clock speeds to be similar between each processor, which we'll explore a bit later. Before getting into the benchmarks, let's talk about the test conditions. In for review today is the Gigabyte Aorus 15G XB, which packs the Core i7-10875H in multiple power configurations, alongside one of Nvidia's new RTX 2070 Super Max-Q GPUs. We'll be covering the GPU in a separate video on the channel later, so stay tuned for that. For RAM, we have 16 gigabytes of DDR4 2933, which is the new maximum speed 10th gen parts support, and there's a 1080p 240Hz display as well. This isn't really a laptop review, but I do have to point out this new Omron mechanical key switch they're using on this laptop because it's, it's really good. One of the areas I think has suffered on laptops is the keyboard. A lot of them are really garbage, but this is a clicky, surprisingly satisfying switch for such a low profile design. The typing experience is nicer than I expected, so kudos to Gigabyte for choosing this key switch. 
Testing laptop hardware in an apples to apples configuration is quite difficult as each system is slightly different, but for all the results you see today, we've tried to remove as many variables as possible. This means all systems have dual channel memory and are all configured to use the Intel default processor power configuration and settings unless otherwise specified. We then average together results from equivalent configurations to provide a generalized look at performance from a given CPU. You can see the full list of laptops we tested in the description. Often laptops come essentially overclocked out of the box and have utilities that allow you to change various power targets and PL1 or PL2 limits. So we always set each laptop to Intel's default 45 watt PL1 limit in these utilities. The Aorus 15G, for example, uses a 52 watt limit by default and allows you to choose between five different limits from 38 watts through to 62 watts. We have also tested the 62 watt configuration today. The short burst power limit PL2 is 80 watts with all setups. The reason why we do this is so that we can compare processor performance at a given power level. Unlike with desktops, power consumption is crucial in laptops. More power hungry parts require larger coolers and therefore larger laptops. Comparing chips on an equivalent power level allows us to see how they would perform in an equivalent type of design. After all, only comparing an 80 watt CPU to a 35 watt CPU in laptops wouldn't make much sense as you simply, you couldn't put the 80 watt chip in a design that only can support 35 watts of cooling capacity. Another thing that people might be asking of us is undervolting performance given it's quite popular with enthusiast laptop buyers. Unfortunately, undervolting is disabled with the 10875H on my Aorus 15G, and when asking around, this seems to be common to some other systems as well. I suspect this is in response to the Plundervolt security vulnerability with Intel CPUs, Although from asking Gigabyte and Intel, I wasn't able to get a clear picture of who specifically disabled undervolting. In any case, it seems that undervolting will be far less accessible and widespread with 10th gen than it was with previous H series generations. Let's start the run of benchmarks with everyone's favorite Cinebench R20. This rendering workload benefits nicely from the extra two cores Intel has added into the mix. The eight core 10875H ends up 12% faster than the last gen Core i7-9750H with six cores in the multi-threaded test. However, in what is perhaps a bit of a surprise, performance doesn't match up with the i9-9880H. This new eight core part is 6% slower than Intel's prior Core i9 processor with the same core count. This suggests that the 10875H isn't clocking quite as high for as long as the 9880H in this burst type application. The 10875H also gets dominated by AMD's Ryzen 9 4900HS despite consuming more power, falling 30% behind the new Zen 2 competitor in this workload. Even when we raise the power limit up to the maximum gigabyte supports with the Aorus 15G at 62 watts, it still falls 18% behind the stunning multi-core performance AMD is providing here. However, the story is different for the single thread workload. Thanks to higher clock speeds, the 10875H is 8% faster than the 9880H in this reasonably long single thread test, as well as 1% ahead of the 4900HS. Previously, the 9880H could quite comfortably run a single core at 4.6-ish gigahertz long term within the 45 watt power limit. So raising the frequency cap up to 4.9 gigahertz, which is what I typically saw in the single thread workload, does allow for faster performance than previous gen CPUs here. I saw very similar performance in Cinebench R15, although here the 10875H is a bit slower in the multi-thread test relative to other CPUs compared to the R20 workload. Compensating for this is a better single thread score, so here the 10875H is up to 10% faster than the 4900HS. However, R20 is more reflective of real world Cinema 4D performance with the latest version, so this is more of a legacy workload these days. Handbrake is another long-term multi-thread workload and we do see a moderate performance boost for this Core i7 CPU compared to the i7-9750H. However, like with Cinebench, the 10875H can't match the 9880H and falls behind the Ryzen 9 4900HS as well, even when pushing up to 62 watts of power consumption. If you plan on using your laptop for X265 video encoding, an 8-core Ryzen APU would be a better choice given its strong performance lead. Blender follows the trend we have seen across the last couple of benchmarks. The 10875H is decently faster than the 9750H, in this case 19% faster, but can't keep up to the 9880H, ending up 3% behind. 
the 10875H is also substantially slower than the Ryzen 9 4900HS here. So, like with our previous two examples, Intel doesn't have the performance to match AMD in long-term multi-thread tasks, and doesn't even come close in terms of efficiency. 7-Zip is a great example of a short-term multi-thread workload that runs entirely in the CPU's boost state. Thanks to a generous 80 watt PL2 power limit, the 10875H has enough power to feed all 8 cores and pull substantially ahead of the 9750H, coming in 26% faster in decompression and 34% faster in compression. It also manages to match the performance of the 9880H. Comparing Intel and AMD in this test does show AMD pulling well ahead in decompression, which is likely going to be the more used workload of the two. However, Intel is 10% faster in compression, I suspect helped out significantly by its larger cache at 16 megabytes versus just 8 megabytes on the AMD side. Excel with large calculations is another benchmark that is favorable to this new 10875H processor. While still around 5% slower than the 9880H, it does come in 18% faster than the 9750H and 9% faster than the Ryzen 9 4900HS. This is a short multi-threaded test and with Intel blasting away nicely in its boost state, it takes the win here. However, for lighter productivity and general app usage, Intel's Core i7-10875H isn't the runaway winner. In PCMark's productivity workload, the 10875H is around 6% slower than the 4900HS, while handily beating the 9750H, while in the Essentials test, which includes app loading and light web browsing, the 4900HS and 10875H offer equivalent performance. Both 8 core offerings here are a step above previous H series CPU, so you can expect around a 10% improvement on something last gen. One particularly interesting case for the 10875H is MATLAB R2020A. Here we are using the built in benchmark, and previously we did find that the Core i9 9880H was able to take the crown over the Ryzen 9 4900HS in this engineering tool. However, the 10875H can't keep up with the 9880H here, it's about 8% behind, so as a result, it falls 4% behind the 4900HS as well. This means that for engineers looking at a workstation laptop, Intel's new Core i7 8-core may not be the way to go compared to Ryzen, we might only be seeing leading performance here with the Core i9 10980HK. Acrobat PDF exporting is an easy win for the Core i7-10875H, blasting through this single core test in record time thanks to a combination of a large cache size and high frequencies. This is one of the worst results for Ryzen, it just can't match the burst speed Intel is offering for this export to image workload. However, this completely flips for AES-256 cryptography. CSoft's Sandra does show the 10875H slotting in between the 9880H and 9750H for cryptography bandwidth, but well behind the Ryzen 9 4900HS. This means that for encryption or decryption tasks, Ryzen CPUs should be able to finish ahead. Now we get into the more compute heavy workload, so there's a bit going on here that needs to be discussed. We'll start with Adobe Photoshop's Iris Blur test, which is mostly CPU limited here when you have a half decent discrete GPU, like is the case with most H series laptops. It's a tight battle at the top between the 8 core options, the 10875H is 5% behind the 9880H, but 6% ahead of the Ryzen 9 4900HS. And we see similar margins in Puget's Photoshop workload. The 10875H isn't the outright fastest CPU for Photoshop, but it's a very capable chip in this app, and notably ahead of the Ryzen 9 4900HS. It's also a decent 16% faster than the 9750H, Photoshop likes frequency, but it also likes cores depending on the task you are performing, and the 10875H is faster in both regards. Time for some Adobe Premiere results. Intel benefits in this application from hardware accelerated encoding via QuickSync. Any configuration that doesn't support this, which includes all AMD processors and my i9-9880H test laptop, falls a fair bit behind in this test. For example, in the Puget export test, the Ryzen 9 4900HS is equivalent to a QuickSync enabled i7-9750H, while the 10875H comes in 11% faster, albeit with a faster GPU as well. However, in this particular workload, we aren't often GPU limited. Intel does see better performance here by virtue of supporting QuickSync, and in many cases, this makes it a better choice for those that like to export videos in Premiere. But Intel doesn't get a comprehensive victory in Premiere. While Intel configurations can be up to 25% faster in specific QuickSync accelerated tests, 
Ryzen is faster for software encoding, for example when performing a 2-pass H.264 encode using the settings we use for our YouTube videos. Intel also falls behind in Puget's live playback test. While the 10875H is 2% faster than the 9880H, it's 9% behind the Ryzen 9 4900HS for viewing footage in the timeline. It's also significantly slower for running lightly threaded effects like warp stabilizer. The 10875H is only 3% faster than the 9750H for stabilizing footage, but 15% slower than AMD's Zen 2 CPU. This isn't a fully single threaded test, it uses 1-2 to two cores with a single instance, and it seems that Intel is only seeing gains when 100% single threaded. Here's a look at how the Core i7-10875H stacks up against the Core i9-9880H in clock speeds across the first 10 minutes of our Handbrake X265 test. Both CPUs fluctuate between 2.7 and 2.8 GHz all-core for the most part, which of course is well below the rated 4.3 GHz all-core turbo for this processor. But mobile CPUs generally don't get anywhere near those all-core numbers long-term due to their pretty harsh power limits. With clock speeds so close between these two processors, this suggests Intel have made pretty much no improvements to 14 nanometer efficiency between the 10th and 9th generations. In this test, the 9880H is faster, about 1.5% faster, and that seems down to very slightly higher clock speeds on average with the 9880H, as well as a higher PL2 state. In the first 10 minutes, the 9880H was clocked 1% higher on average. Before wrapping this one up, Let's take a look at some performance comparisons. We'll start here with the Core i7-10875H versus the Core i9-9880H, a battle of two very similar CPUs. The 10875H has a clear advantage in single-threaded workloads, but outside of this, the 9880H is marginally faster, slightly faster in long-term multi-threaded tasks, and moderately faster in shorter term tasks where the higher PL2 limit for our 9880H system leads to an advantage. From an efficiency standpoint though, both CPUs seem identical and that's yeah, basically because they are. Compared to the Core i7-9750H, the Core i7-10875H does bring a performance gain to the table. In single threaded workloads, this could be a 15 to 20% gain, while for multi-thread, we're looking at 10 to 20% depending on the test. The 10875H is universally faster as it has both more cores and higher single core turbo frequencies within the same power limit. As it can run more cores at a relatively small decrease to frequency, it ends up sitting in a more efficient point on the voltage frequency curve, which is why we see higher performance despite the same 45 watt power limit. As for increasing the TDP of this processor from its default 45 watts up to the maximum 62 watts supported by our Gigabyte Aorus 15 outside of using XTU, you can expect to see up to an 18% performance improvement in long-term multi-thread workloads. However, gains for most other workloads are limited as they're either single core or only use the boost period which remain unchanged. The Core i7-10875H is generally slower than the Ryzen 9 4900HS while consuming more power. This is especially true for any long-term multi-threaded workloads, where the 10875H is 25-30% to slower. In lightly threaded tests, including short-term ones, the 10875H is also either marginally slower or equivalent to AMD's efficient Zen 2 design. However, the 10875H does take the lead in pure single-thread tests, as well as anything cache-limited like Excel or Photoshop. Workloads that make use of quick sync like Premiere Exports are also faster on the Intel option. Despite being able to easily increase the power limit on the 10875H, which is something our Ryzen 9 4900HS test system in the ASUS Zephyrus G14 did not support, the 10875H is still generally slower in most workloads at 62 watts, especially anything long-term or multi-threaded. Unless you can find a 10875H system that really ups that power budget to above 90 watts, I expect most 10875H configurations to come in behind a similar Ryzen system in these sorts of tests. And this brings me to the all-important question. What do I think of the Intel Core i7-10875H, the first 10th gen Comet Lake H processor I've tested, and perhaps the most interesting of the bunch? Well, I know the comment section is going to be filled with people making fun of Intel's 14 nanometer process and Skylake architecture and the lack of gains Intel have been able to make for a few years now. Part of this is definitely valid, but I do think there are some positives here, so I'll talk about those things first. The biggest one for me is Intel bringing 8 cores 
down into the Core i7 space for the first time. Previously, you'd need to spend quite a lot of money to get a Core i9 system if you wanted an 8-core processor, but now, thanks to competition from AMD and Ryzen, Intel have basically been forced into offering Core i9 performance at a lower price point. In practice, you're getting 10 to 20% more performance than an i7 9758 CPU. Intel also holds the single thread performance crown. It's not really because they're hitting 5 GHz, because in most circumstances with this CPU, they aren't. But even at a reasonably high 4.8 to 4.9 GHz or so, they have the best single thread performance. Combined with a larger cache and some niche advantages like QuickSync supported in applications like Premiere, there are some workloads where Intel's 8 core CPU is the fastest. But that's about where the positives end for the Core i7-10875H, and in fact, some of the points I just made were perhaps a bit misleading, because while the Core i7-10875H is now bringing 8 cores down to Core i7 prices, it's not fully replacing the Core i7-9750H, which was used across a wide range of systems. Typically speaking, what we'll actually be seeing is those cheaper to mid-range 9750H laptops getting upgraded to the 6-core 10750H, not the 10875H. The 10875H from pricing we've been able to see from manufacturers like MSI and Gigabyte is still going to sit a class above the 10750H. Not quite up there with the Core i9s of old, but still reasonably expensive. MSI's cheapest 10875H laptop, for example, starts at $1,800 US dollars with an RTX 2060 GPU, while the 10750H is available in $1,200 systems. Directly comparing their Creator 17 systems shows the 10875H laptop is a $300 more expensive option. And most of the laptops that use the 10875H are your premium RTX 2070 class units, while the 10750H is found with GPUs down to the 1660 Ti and likely lower when more laptops hit the market. This presents a clear pricing problem for Intel. Right now you can get an ASUS Tough Gaming A15 with the Ryzen 7 4800H and RTX 2060 for just $1200. Intel laptops that also feature the RTX 2060 and compete on price are using a 6-core CPU, not this new 8-core. So while Intel has reduced pricing a bit, it's not enough to actually put their 8-core in direct price competition with AMD's 8-core, at least in this early wave of systems. You're still paying a premium to go from the 6-core system in this gen or the previous gen up to an 8-core. And it kind of gets worse from there because not only is AMD offering a cheaper 8-core CPU, their Zen 2 offering, at least the Ryzen 9 4900HS, is actually equal to or faster than the Core i7-10875H in a lot of workloads. AMD's APU is significantly faster in anything long-term and multi-threaded, and holds its own in lighter productivity and burst-type applications, while being hugely more efficient. The Ryzen processor isn't always faster, pure single-thread workloads are Intel's strength, but I'm comfortable saying that most of the time, the Ryzen APU is better, especially when you consider how frequently you'll be using more than one core in the real world, and that's where Ryzen seems to have an advantage. What's then bitterly disappointing is just how many OEMs have opted to launch high-end H-series laptops with 10th gen Intel parts instead of swapping over to Ryzen. Any laptop that has the Core i7-10875H in it would likely be better off with the Ryzen 7 4800H at no increase to price. So yeah, it's nice we can now get an 8-core Intel CPU in some designs that previously used 6 cores, and yes, when strictly comparing laptops, you'll see a performance uplift, but that uplift could have been even greater had the OEM upgraded to Ryzen with this generation. Now, if I'm being sensible here, I don't think fully ditching Intel options is the right move. For some people, especially those using Premiere or highly single-threaded applications, buying an Intel model would be the better choice. But given AMD's monstrous lead in multi-core, at the very least, I'd like to see consumers given the choice between AMD or Intel mobile processors, especially at the high end, where currently there are no AMD options with powerful discrete GPUs. That's a missed opportunity. And judging by how quickly Ryzen laptops are selling out, I think the first OEM to bring something high-end to market will be cashing in big time. We're just not in a world where Intel offer the outright best processors anymore, even with this 10th generation launch, and I think the market needs to reflect this.
What remains up in the air at this point is which CPU is faster for high-end discrete GPU gaming. That's something I'll have to explore when I get the right laptop on hand. I think it will be a close battle between AMD and Intel based on previous testing, but I'm not willing to call it either way until I run the benchmarks, so look out for that on the channel over the coming weeks. And that's it for this lengthy investigation into Intel's new 8-core processor in their Core i7 range. Hopefully you've got all the benchmark information that you need to make a decision on which laptop will be the superior choice for productivity workloads. I'm hoping to test, as I said, the rest of Intel's 10th gen lineup, including the 6 cores and even the quad cores, which can be a little difficult to get in the coming weeks, plus more Ryzen APUs as well. Hoping to test the 4800H uh, very shortly, as well as, of course, there's U-series coming up, and hopefully we'll get the 6-core H-series parts in as well. So lots of different laptops, CPUs, and APUs to be testing right now so if you're very interested in all of that stuff uh, it's well worth subscribing to Hardware Unbox, where you'll find all of that content come out on the channels very, very shortly. Also, a huge shout out to our Patreon members who do make testing some of these laptops possible because we are starting to invest some of the money that we get through there into testing laptops. We're already putting that into all sorts of other things on the channel, but we're just starting to expand uh, that into laptops as well. So we really appreciate all the support we get through there. If you're interested in signing up and getting all the perks, links to that are in the description below, and I'll catch you in the next one.